A major event happened in the 17th century. An event that came to define how we live, think and act today, 300 years later. An event so important that it is both the source and cause of our deepest anxieties and expectations. This event prompted the greatest scientific, social and economic progress in the history of humanity, coinciding with the rise of the Western civilization and the beginning of what later became known as the Great Divergence. This event was the emergence of capitalism, a system whose consequences reverberate more powerfully than ever to our day, permeating the entire spectrum of human existence, from our values, principles and activities to our thoughts and practices. What is capitalism? Where did it come from? How did it come about and why does it represent such a watershed moment in the history of mankind? The current video will attempt to answer some of these questions and try to provide a glimpse of modern-day capitalism, its spread, variations, features, and what it holds for the future, both in the short and long term. Most scholars consider the idea of merchant capitalism as the origin of modern capitalism. Merchant capitalism distinguished itself from more fully developed capitalism by its focus on simply moving goods from a market where they are cheap to a market where they are expensive. Rather than influencing the mode of the production of those goods, merchant capitalism conceived of the world as a zero-sum game where every profit was made necessarily at the expense of others. Thus, merchant capitalism preceded the capitalist mode of production and consisted in the process of primitive accumulation of capital, where profit was quite simply the result of scarcity and distance. Since profit was made from trading in scarce products rather than rationalizing production, the impact of merchant capitalism on society was limited. Most of the European population could get on with their daily work without being affected by the activities of these owners of capital. From this point on, capitalism involved the investment of money to make more money. While servants had long done this, it was when production was financed in this way that a transformative capitalism came into being. Rather than involving only a small part of the economy such as before, in capitalism proper the whole economy becomes dependent on the reinvestment of capital and this occurs when it is not just trade that is financed but production as well. It is only in the mid-18th century that a group of economic theorists led by David Hume and Adam Smith challenged fundamental mercantilist doctrines, such as the belief that global wealth remained constant and that a state could only increase its wealth at the expense of another. During the Industrial Revolution, industrialists replaced merchants as the dominant factor in the capitalist system and effected the decline of the traditional handicraft skills of artisans, guilds and journeymen. Also during this period, the surplus generated by the rise of commercial agriculture encouraged increased mechanization of agriculture. Industrial capitalism marked the development of the factory system of manufacturing, characterized by a complex division of labor between and within work process and the routine of work tasks. All these factors contributed in equal measure to establish the domination of a new revolutionary economic system, the capitalist mode of production. A feature of this development that distinguished capitalism from previous systems was the use of accumulated capital to enlarge productive capacity rather than to invest in economically unproductive enterprises. Besides, this characteristic was encouraged by several changes in the perceptions and mentalities of early modern society. One of these had to do with the impact of the Protestant Reformation in the promotion of contemporary virtues such as hard work, discipline, and frugality. A much-known thesis of Max Weber espoused in his book The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism identifies precisely the Reformation as intellectual engine of capitalism, an event without which its emergence would not have been possible. Its system of retributive moral, anchored in the two opposite poles of virtue and sin, offered a model with which to understand economic inequality, justifying it on the grounds that the wealthy were more virtuous than the poor. Another contributing factor was the increase in Europe's supply of precious metals and the resulting inflation prices. Wages did not rise as fast as prices in this period, 
and the main beneficiaries of the inflation were the capitalists. The early capitalists also enjoyed the benefits of the rise of strong national states during the mercantilist era, the so-called absolutist states. The policies of national power followed by these states succeeded in providing the basic social conditions such as uniform monetary systems and legal codes necessary for economic development and eventually made possible the shift from public to private initiative. Beginning in the 18th century in England, the focus of capitalist development shifted from commerce to industry. The steady capital accumulation of the preceding centuries was invested in the application of technical knowledge. The ideology of classical capitalism was put to the test, and the economic decisions were largely, but not always, left to the free play of self-regulating market forces. After the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars had swept into oblivion the remnants of feudalism, Smith's policies were increasingly put into practice. The policies of 19th century political liberalism included, among others, free trade, sound money, balanced budgets and minimum levels of poor relief. The growth of industrial capitalism and the development of the factory also created a vast new class of industrial workers whose generally miserable conditions inspired the revolutionary philosophy of Karl Marx. In economic terms, World War I marked a turning point in the development of capitalism. After the war, international markets shrank, the gold standard was abandoned in favor of national currencies, and banking hegemony passed from Europe to the United States. Furthermore, the Great Depression of the 1930s brought the policy of laissez-faire to an end, and for a time created sympathy for socialism among many intellectuals, and especially in Europe, among large swaths of middle-class professionals and workers. In the decades immediately following World War II, the economies of the major capitalist countries, all of which had adopted some version of the welfare state, performed well, restoring some of the confidence in the capitalist system that had been lost in the 1930s. Despite its immense popularity, Marx's prediction of the inevitable overthrow of capitalism proved short-sighted and capitalism would move on to become the determining force of the global economy throughout the second half of the 20th century. Anti-capitalist ideologies both from the right and the left and exemplified in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia saw themselves unable to stop the triumphant march of capitalism, whether during the war, in the post-war era or later still after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Apart from theories calling for the end of history in the wake of the Soviet fall, or others emphasizing its continuation in the form of the clash of civilizations, capitalism continues its indefatigable march in the 21st century, a march that trails under multiple incarnations and variants. It becomes thus evident in this context that capitalism is not the same everywhere, nor could it be. While Swedish capitalism shows that in certain conditions it can provide the basis for centralized cooperation, balanced corporate management and sensible welfare economy, American capitalism has been at the opposite end of the ideological spectrum. Thomas Piketty has described an explosion of inequality which after the 1970s returned the United States to the level of income inequality previously reached in the 1920s. He sees this as a result of the super salaries earned by super managers who effectively set their own salaries through the control of corporations they had. In such cases, inequality is brutal and those at the bottom end of the economic spectrum may well feel that their world is collapsing in the midst of an economic crisis. They may indeed think that the whole capitalist system is coming to an end. Such crises of capitalism are not, however, exceptional events, but rather a normal part of the functioning of a capitalist society. Throughout the 19th, 20th and 21st century, they became a regular feature of economic life, being previous crises well-known phenomena the current economic paradigm. Previous historical cases include the tulip bubble of the 17th century Amsterdam, the Great Depression of the 1930s, or the more recent recession, 2007-2009. Following the financial crisis of 2007 and the Great Recession that accompanied it, there was a renewed interest in socialism among many people in the United States, especially millennials, a group that had been particularly hard hit by the recession. Polls conducted during 2010 found that a slight majority of millennials had a positive view of socialism and that support for socialism had increased in every age group 
except those aged 65 or older. It should be noted, however, that the policies actually favoured by such groups differed little in their scope and purpose from the New Deal regulatory and social welfare programs of the 1930s, and hardly amounted to orthodox socialism. So what does the future of capitalism hold for the global and interconnected era of digital economy? Albeit we can be sure that the crisis will occur, there is little reason to suppose that one of these will be final. Much more difficult to assess is, however, the significance and impact of capitalism in long-term perspective, since the future of capitalism depends not just on capitalism, but on the way people respond to it. In other words, it depends on how governments respond, how political and religious movements emerge and develop, and how capitalists themselves respond to their surrounding environment. Arguably, there's a good chance that the future of capitalism will be shaped not by the institutions and structures of the West, but by the countries of the East and the West's reaction to them. The rising capitalisms of the East are not without problems, but they boast a dynamism and an institutional distinctiveness that puts them on different trajectories, not only from the West, but also from each other. It is thus important not to lump them together as into the vast catch-all term of Eastern capitalism. Japanese, Chinese and Singaporean capitalism, to name only three notable variants, do share certain features, but they are also very different from each other. As the center of the new world order shifts progressively from the west to the east, we can safely assume that an increasingly greater share of the relevant economic decisions will take place in the east, forcing the west to adapt in order to remain competitive. It is this future, shaped by the rise of China and the threats of Asian influence over long-standing Western hegemony, that will dictate the direction and nature of the new 21st century capitalist world order.